Is that all now? Yes. Yeah. Ooh, I'm going to need to turn it down a little bit. I'm getting echoes and things. Um, it's hard for me to speak softly enough to not definitely say that. Um, oh, it's down up here. Okay. All right, hello. That's better. Okay. Can you, is that okay? I'm not, if I start talking loud, I'm not going to definitely be very good. All right. Um, so, uh, so my talk today, I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about technologies and evolutionary process, how it relates to understanding economic growth. I'll give an application to the, the mitigation of global warming. Um, talk about rates of technological change um, and empirical laws for technological improvement. And I'm trying to get some ideas about where those might come from and saying a bit about the research I'm doing to try and understand these questions. Um, you know, technology is something that's been with us for a long time and that we use in lots of different ways and that we have co-evolved with. There's a debate of, you know, it's not clear that there is a chicken and egg. Technology may be one of the influences that caused us to get a big brain. And um, the first tool use is already 2.3 million years ago. And I don't know, I have, I have a bunch of these kind of slides, but I particularly like this one of the guy in skis with a funny hat, a little hole, and enormously long skis um, from a Stone Age. Um, one of the first people to think about technologies in the evolving process was Samuel Butler, who in 1863 wrote an essay called Darwin Among, Machi Among the Machines. This was only about three years after the origin of species appeared. And in this essay, he imagined humanity competing with um, humanity and, and technology itself evolving. And he went on to write a book called Irwan, which is kind of a play on nowhere, uh, about some place in a remote part of New Zealand where um, people are very worried about machines evolving. And, and um, give some examples. Another person who inspired me, who I read as a teenager, was Tillard Deschardins. He was quite an interesting figure. Um, he was a, I believe, um, what's called a Jesuit priest. Um, he wrote extensively about evolution. He was also a fairly famous physical anthropologist. He's believed by some to be responsible for the hoax of the Piltdown Man, which he did as a joke that got blown way out of proportion. Um, and he wrote a lot about what he called the noosphere. And so the noosphere is biology, technology, and culture that he argued are evolving along together and are, should not be separated because it's really the combination of the three that's important. His work was, most of his work was not published in his lifetime because being a priest, they were very nervous about that. But when he died in the early 50s, um, his work was finally published. So um, he just, Stress, he stressed these as evolutionary processes. Um, one can, can compare biological and technological evolution, and it's impossible to get hung up on lots of uh, naive um, things. But let me just say in a broad sweep what I think um, the key differences and similarities are. Um, both are driven by selection. In both cases, there's some version of descent with variation and selection, which is what Darwin viewed as the key components of, um, of evolution. Um, both you know, result in diversity, I and mean, that's the variation part. There's incremental variation. There's a temporal progression. And um, I would argue that in both cases, there's purposeful function of units. Um, differences are, in a way, self things are created, self-reproduction in biology versus artificial manufacture for technology, um, random variation in biological evolution versus conscious design, although if we um, have time, I'll mention a theory we have for technological evolution and design where we assume that things just evolve randomly that I think actually is informative and I think often we aren't quite as far away from that as we imagine. Um, um, there's microscopic versus macroscopic scale of organization. In biology, things are organized, first of all, they're very small, 
And, and the organization of, of an organism is a very clearly defined thing with um, a clear identity. In the economy, I'll argue that things are much more spread out. And if you think about the way stuff actually gets made, it's made in a very diffuse way, at this point, scattered all over the world. That's what's driving globalization, is actually largely the way in which technologies are now manufactured, um, which is literally global. Um, innovation and technology is analogous to horizontal gene transfer. That is, in bacteria, uh, unlike, um, say, um, larger organisms, um, a bacterium can have sex with another bacterium and grab part of their genome and stick it in to the bacterium's genome in a partial way. And so bacteria can have genomes that are sort of amalgams of things picked up from lots of different ancestors. Uh, um, technologies evolve in very much the same way. So one has to remember this because it has very important implications for things like taxonomy of technology, which is one of the problems I'm interested in. Um, so, techno no, we, I'm going to change gears a bit to ask why, why should we be thinking about understanding technology? Uh, well, Solow did a famous, wrote a famous paper in 1956 in which he pointed out that growth theory at the time could not explain growth because there was this part that you had to have which amounted to technology that seems to be responsible for about 80%. And so in a, in a I don't know if we have any chalk. Uh, it's in the box. Uh, red boxes? Yes. Red boxes, yes. Infinite supply of chalk. Um, so in, in economics, there's something called a production function where it looks something like um, uh, this. And so there's an exponent here and an exponent here. And so this is equal to the production of a firm where this is some number, this is the capital, and this is the labor. And so what Solo did is he showed that when you try and fit this model and with some appropriate extensions to deal with some things, that all the action ends up being concentrated on this A term, which is technology. So in traditional economic theory, in fact, almost all economic theory, technology is just a scaler. Um, so others, though, have argued, like Nate Rosenberg and Brian Arthur, that you really have to get inside the black box and understand what technology is. It'd be a, little, a bit like calling biology, you know, B, and putting B of T, and somehow biology is just a, uh, a number that's kind of described evolution. Um, now, I'm going to give you another motivation that's related to the fact that some goods drop in price much faster than others. This was originally worried about by two fellows named Prebish and Singer, who in 1950 both wrote papers and worried that commodities might be dropping in price faster than technologies, which if it's true is very bad for developing countries because many developing countries or underdeveloped countries have most of their export income from, um, from commodities, not from technology, and therefore that might explain part of why uh, underdeveloped countries tend to fall behind. But we've, we've taken a careful look at this, actually motivated with a different motivation, and seeing that, um, well, the story is a bit, I think that's actually missing the main story. The main story is that, well, here I show you um, a variety of different commodities. And so you can see the different commodities there, and you can see their prices there. Normalized, so they all start at the same value in 1960. And you watch them going forward, and you see them spreading out. But if you look at the scale, and apparently it can be a little clearer, we could have labeled it better. But you can see that the thing that increases the most over a 50-year span only increases by a factor of three. The thing that decreases the most maybe decreases by a factor of five. Um, um, so actually, we think the striking thing is that they don't actually spread or vary all that much. In fact, um, I think I'm just going to skip this slide and do this slide, which is less technical. In contrast, if you look at technologies, 
And so here we're looking at, um, I guess I have this cool retro pointer I can use. Um, so you look at different transistors, right? different technologies ranging from transistors, which are here, to air fitters, which are up here. Um, you can see there's vastly different rates in the change in these technology prices over time. And transistors, on the one hand, have dropped in price by a factor of 10 to the 8. And some even argue that's an underestimate because a modern transistor is much better than an old transistor. Um, in contrast, many other technologies and most commodities are, are hardly changing at all. And in fact, in this next slide, I show the commodities from the previous slide against these technologies, which we've carefully picked to be the ones that have actually changed a lot. And there's a few technologies. The point is there's a few technologies that improve at a dramatic rate. And so there's, we think the interesting thing is not in comparing technologies and commodities, but in noting that there's a huge dispersion in the improvement rates of technologies. And um, that we think is an important thing to bear in mind for lots of reasons. Um, in particular, I think if you want to think about public investment in technologies, you really need to take this into account. And so to motivate this, I'll, I'm showing a slide here, it relates to the question of um, green growth. If we're going to deal with climate change and um, greenhouse gases, and if we're going to generate energy without emitting lots of greenhouse gases, how are we going to do it? Well, let's compare three technologies here. One is um, coal fuel prices. So in particular for electricity generation, and there's a story behind this I'm not going to go into too much depth in, but we wrote a paper on uh, what factors are influence the price of um, coal-fired electricity. So if you look at coal-fired electricity, it's about 40% the cost of building a plant, about 20% the operating and maintenance, and about 40% just the cost of buying the coal that you have to burn to generate the power. Now when we looked at it, what we saw is that actually over a century, the cost of building plants had dropped. It's cheaper to build a coal plant that generates a, a, you know, a lot of power now uh, per watt than it was um, 80 years ago. Um, operating maintenance hasn't changed much, and coal fuel prices actually have not changed much at all. In fact, if you take a long history, and here I show 150 year history of coal fuel prices, you can see and on a scale where I'm, I'm looking at the amount it contributes to the price of the electricity, you can see that that's hardly changed in 150 years. I mean, it fluctuates up and down. There is a kind of a coal bubble here, but it comes back down. And by the way, if we looked at oil or natural gas, uh, we would see pretty much the same series. In fact, if you look at just about any mineral, just about anything you pull out of the ground, you see a similar series. The most extreme case you can find, it only changes by a factor of less than 10. So, it's remarkably constant, is the point, with some random fluctuation. Now, as another example, let's look at nuclear power. So these red triangles I show are the electricity price for nuclear power for plants built in the US at the time where the plants came online. So there's, I don't know, 100 or so such plants. and. What you see is across the span of time from when we first start building them in about 1965 until the last one in this sample is built, which is around early 80s sometime. Um, well, you might ask, did costs go down as a result? Did people learn from building the old nuclear plants, the previous nuclear plants, and drive the cost down? The answer is no. In fact, there is a fairly clear trend. Costs at the end of this are about three times higher than they were at the beginning. That's controlling for inflation. Um, um, so nuclear power certainly hasn't dropped in price. Actually, it's gone up. Now, that may that is likely substantially because of safety. That is, during that period, we had Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, and people got much more nervous about building nuclear plants and began imposing higher standards for safety than there were before. And this certainly drove the cost up. Now, whether it can account for the whole rise, I don't know. But the important point is that it certainly didn't come down. And by the way, this cross here is for the Hinkley point 
nuclear reactor that Britain has decided to build, um, significantly with Chinese money. The Chinese are going to own maybe 35 percent of it. It's slated sta to come online in about 2022, and at a price. In order to get it built, they had to be guaranteed a price, which is the price shown where that cross is. Now, in contrast. Let's compare photovoltaic solar energy. So photovoltaic solar energy has been around just about the same length of time as nuclear power. It was invented in a space program in the US for um, powering satellites. And, um, or at least first used, you can argue where it was really first invented, but that was the first use. And um, um, so what you see is actually since it was invented, it's come down by a back factor of about 5,000. And here you see the trajectory in recent years uh, decreasing. Now, let me just mention something. I've, um, um, in order to make this figure, I normally when you generate power, what you want to do is, is look at kilowatts per hour, and you have to do things like amortize out the cost of investments, which depends on things like interest rates, and so on. So the actual cost of power depends on things that may vary from region to region and time to time. And in particular, if you think about something like solar energy, the cost of generating power with solar energy in Britain is substantially higher than it is in, say, New Mexico, where I lived until I moved to Oxford. <coughs> and uh, I can tell you, moving here, the difference is rather dramatic. Where I come from, we have 300 out of 360 sunny days a year. And when we say sunny, we mean sunny. Uh, so I had a little bit of a hard time getting used to the British winter. And I can understand on that point the skepticism about uh, solar energy. On the other hand, the drop in price has been dramatic. And um, now, this is probably even a little bit pessimistic. But what I did is I normalized it. So over here, I've used the module price. And I've normalized this based on the most recent commercial installation of photovoltaic solar energy in the United States which is estimated to be around 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Nuclear plants are still cheaper than that, but not by much. And if you extrapolate, what you see is the crossover is coming soon. And if the trend continues, um, solar PV should become substantially cheaper than nuclear power. And in fact, this dashed line here was the original sunshot target, where they said we could just get PV down to that price. Um, it will um, be coal, and you know that should happen by 2030. That's without being coal without any carbon tax. So, and we're, we're almost certainly going to have a carbon tax before 2030. So the crossover is going to come sooner. So the interesting point is that the rate of change of these technologies is dramatically different. And if you're thinking about public policy, it makes a difference because you ought to be thinking ahead. And as I'll talk about in this talk, you need to think about the effect of investment because when you invest in a technology, you can help it move its price down. And so for public investments, this is a critical thing that needs to be taken into account. So by the way, it's a small group. So just raise your hand and ask me questions as I go along. There's no point in sitting there like a lump if you have a question. Yes? Yeah, I'm Good just man. wondering, do you, how do, is that just a capital uh, capacity and solve costs that you're comparing with nuclear and photovoltaics, and um, are you can, are you taking account of like, the intermittency and the external externalities associated no. with So, so this commercial installation, yeah. yeah. So that's why it's much cleaner. So I should have explained this a little better. Here we're measuring the the price, the module price, in dollars per watt peak. So that's a very clear thing. You know, you take the module and you ask, shine direct sunlight on it pointing at the right angle, how much do you generate, how many watts do you generate per dollar? Very clear measure. In contrast, over here, we have um, cents per kilowatt hour, which is a much fuzzier measure because, as I said, that may depend on things like how much it costs to fund the plant, right? So what I've done here is just to normalize the two, I take the most recent point here, and I line it up to be the figure in dollars per watt peak for a commercial photovoltaic plant that I think is probably in the Mojave Desert. Okay? But of course, you can bring it to Oxford, you're going to go way back up because you don't have a lot of sunlight here. Um, so that has to be done in mind. 
Um, any other questions? Yes? Uh, did your estimates also uh, subtract the subsidies for the government? Now, subsidies are a tricky issue, and, and we have not attempted. What we're looking at here is just the commercial price for selling, for photovoltaic, the commercial price for selling units. When you start looking at the subsidies, they, they don't do what you would, might naively expect. You might ask, which, techno, which energy source is subsidized the most? I'm curious, who, who think, any votes? What gets the biggest subsidy? Oil. Right. Oil gets the biggest subsidy. Nuclear gets very big subsidies. Um, with solar and wind come in, you know, somewhere behind those, dramatically behind oil and still actually quite a bit behind nuclear. So it's a little bit hard to unravel subsidies uh, and, and determine how they affect. So I haven't really tried to do that here. But if anything, it counts against solar relative to the other two. Um, okay, now you might say, well, technology, that's about innovation. You can't predict innovation. Uh, that's by its very defi definition, it's something new, it should be unpredictable. So one of the main points I'm going to make is that no, that's not true. Innovation is actually fairly predictable in some way. And one of the first people to notice this was a guy named Theodore Paul Wright, who um, in 1936 wrote a paper pointing out that if you looked at aircraft factories and you looked at a specific aircraft and a specific type of plane, and you just plotted um, the cost of that plane as a function of the cumulative number of planes that have been produced, that um, roughly speaking, you would get points lying on a straight line on a long broad scale, that is roughly speaking, it's a power law. And the power, so it's a form, I showed it there, y equals x to the minus alpha. And the power is typically such that what's called the progress ratio is around 20% or 80%, meaning if you double the cumulative production, the price, the price drops to by 20%, that is, it becomes 80% of what it was before the doubling happened. So he wrote this specifically for airplanes, but since then there's probably a thousand papers pointing out that this basic law holds for lots of things, and it holds at the level of individual products and individual plants, it holds at the level of whole technologies. Um, it doesn't always hold. So I want to make that clear. But it holds in a lot of cases. And, um, and so, by the way, so here we see Wright's Law, um, examples of Wright's Law for um, four different technologies, including transistors, photovoltaics, hard disk drives, and ethanol. And we see that they all sit roughly on straight lines across the range where they're measured with somewhat different slopes corresponding to different alphas. But a typical alpha is, as Wright originally noted, around 20%. Now, as I said, this doesn't always hold. And one of the biggest problems is that you have to find technologies where there's a clear metric for what it is that's improving. So as an example of where this can go wrong, or where it can go right, um, let's take Ford Model Ts. So Henry Ford is famous because in 1909 he said, I'm going to make a car the common man can afford. And so until actually I think about 1925, Ford made the Model T and he just made the same car. He didn't change the design, he just figured out ways to make it cheaper. And so this is shown in you know, 19, 50 something dollars. And you can see that it's not a bad fit to the power law. And Indeed, he did make cars dramatically cheaper from $4,000 down to $900 or so, or no, yeah, $900 or so, $1950 um, during that space of time. Seems to work great. But then if you apply this to the rest of Ford motor cars, in 1925, Ford said, I have made a car the common man can afford. I am now going to make better cars. And so they came out with the Model A and this whole series of other cars. And indeed, actually what you see is the price of cars went back up. The problem is a car is not the right kind of unit. In contrast to the other slide I showed you, we were looking at kilowatts or ethanol or something that's more or less a um, homogeneous product. So you have to be careful about Wright's Law. You shouldn't expect it to work all the time. 
Now, the other famous law relating to technological change, more famous than Wright's law, although it's much later, is due to Gordon Moore, um, who famously postulated that transistor density uh, came down exponentially with a halving time, or a doubling time for the density um, that I always forget. Originally, he said two years, and now it's 18 months, or vice versa, I can't remember. Um, and so we show a plot here, and you can see this is actually supplied by Gordon Moore himself, who was also nice enough to send us his data. And um, so it's held pretty well. And what people started noticing, in addition to more, to specific pronouncement Moore's made, is that a lot of other things related to computers were coming down in a similar way. CPU speed, um, memory capacity, uh, cost, lots of things when you plot them related to computers came down exponentially. And people like Bill Gates are on record as saying that this is unique to the computer business. But actually, what we see is that we take these same four products that I mentioned a while ago, transistors, photovoltaics, hard disk drives, and ethanol, and we now plot them instead of versus cumulative production, which is what we were plotting before, we now just plot things versus time. We plot log of unit price here. What we see is they all more or less sit on exponentials, but with different slopes. And so this also seems to work pretty well. So uh, it's a bit of a mystery. How can the two things work? Both work. And just to give you a comparison, I take the same four technologies and I show you the more plot here. And I show you the right plot here. So you can you know, ask yourself which looks better. Um, interestingly, you, you might know right away that if you look at transistors, you get a really beautiful fit here. You get a pretty good fit, but not quite as good a fit here. Now notice, we aren't talking about transistor density here. We're talking about cost in order to compare the things directly. Um, so both laws seem to roughly hold. Um, and remember, you can ask me questions anytime. Now, one might ask, how can these be compatible? And so we, um, we thought about this, and we actually came up with an idea of what was going on, and we tested it. Now, it turns out somebody else had this. But one of the things we noticed is that if you look at production versus time, you also get something that looks exponentially, in exponentially increasing for all these technologies. And so this is now the same kind of plot we're plotting production volume. So we see the production volume of transistors is going up. In fact, it goes up even faster than the cost comes down. Um, now, it turns out this is, there's a trivial explanation. It's not quite an explanation. There's just an identity that explains this, which is that if you have production going up exponentially, and you have costs dropping exponentially with some different exponent, then if you just eliminate time from these equations and solve for y in terms of x, you get x to the minus v over a. That is, you get Wright's law back, where the exponent for Wright's law, which I called alpha before, is now minus v over a. And we collected a lot of data about technologies and tested this. And sure enough, there's about 50 technologies. and. Um, and you can see that we're comparing v over a to this exponent alpha from Wright's law, and everything pretty much clusters along the diagonal, and um, suggesting that there's a real similarity there. Now, the two things are not de facto equivalent. That is, you can, you can first of all, um, you can, um, well, there, it, it could be that one of these is right and the other one's wrong. And, but it's just, if once you have both exponential increase in cost in production and exponential decrease in cost, once you have those two facts together, that implies Wright's law. Wright's law, in contrast, does not imply the other two. Now, I show a picture of my old postdoc, Bela Naj. A bit, a bit of a strange story about this. Bela um, uh, was a great postdoc, had lots of enthusiasm for this project. And, but in the course of doing this, he got curious about this fellow Sahal because he seemed to have disappeared from the literature in about 1980. And, um, well, we tried to track him down. It turns out he didn't just disappear from the literature, he disappeared. Um, he literally vanished and nobody ever heard of him, including Bela managed to make contact with his brother. 
And his brother said, well, yeah, he disappeared, and you know, we've been very worried about him. If you find out anything about him, let us know. Well, the ironic thing here is that about two years ago now, Bela, who took a job in Australia, it's a long story, um, went back to Transylvania to see his family, and on the way back to Australia, disappeared in Singapore. So, you know, we, we know that he made it to Singapore, and, he, and he's not known to have left, but we don't know what happened to him. So um, it's a bit strange, rather a bizarre coincidence. Now, I'm, um, I'm going to make a hypothesis about, a very simple hypothesis about technological improvement, because really, let me motivate this. If these laws hold, well, we should be able to use them to predict stuff about what, how fast technologies are going to improve. And you, you can see that, for example, different technologies improve at dramatically different rates. Is that reliable? How well can you predict? So we have an early paper where we do that. I'll, um, but I'm, I'm going to show you the updated version that we're working on now. Um, what we do is we recast Moore's Law as a random walk with drift. So that is, if y of t is the log cost, and y of t plus at time t, and y of t plus 1 is the logarithm of the cost at time t plus 1, then if you rewrite Moore's Law as a random walk with drift, it says that this is equal to some exponent mu, which you expect to be negative if it's improving, plus some scale constant k that has to do with how noisy it is, times, we write this here as a noise process with um, zero mean and, and variance one. And so this is a, an hypothesis about how technology improves. Wright's law can also be rewritten, and this is a bit technical, so I won't go into it, but you can also write that in time series form as it's looking like this, where this is now the exponent, I guess I was calling it alpha before. This is the production that in your t, t plus one, this is the production in your t. You have some other constant here for the noise. And so we've reformulated these and used these to predict. We actually wrote an earlier paper just using regressions, but we realized this was a better way to do it. Now, and then what we did is we used time casting. So we pretend to be some given time in the past. We pick a year like 1980. And, and then we use a method like Wright's Law or Moore's Law to try and predict what technology costs are going to be in the future, like 1990. And so that would be a 10-year prediction horizon. And then we go forward and we test this for lots of different times and lots of different technologies. Um, now our hypothesis again is that all technologies are improving in the same way, except, it's an important except, for their parameters. So if you think, so we have two hypotheses, one would be Moore's Law, the other would be Wright's Law. And so under Moore's Law, these are the two parameters that will character, mu and k, will characterize that technology. So, um, so just to see how we do this, it's very simple. So we show here, say, global tags, and we show the logarithm of the cost here. And so here's the Moore plot and time here. So we see all the, the, the prices, the foldable takes here, that's the time series. And here we see Wright's Law, so we take the cumulative production here, and again the log cost. And then what we go along is we, we take little windows of data, like for this we used a very short window just for demonstration purposes, say six points. And we use those six points to fit the parameters, k and mu for Moore's Law, or w and s for Wright's Law. And then we crawl along and we just make forecasts everywhere. And we record the quality of those forecasts on different horizons. And, and we see how we do. And you can see sometimes we make wild forecasts, like here's a point where you're an inflection point, you make quite a lousy forecast right there. But then you know it gets better and you make lots of good forecasts too. So we looked at this and here you look at the normalized errors for Moore's Law here against the normalized errors for Wright's Law here. And you can see that most of the points are lining up along the diagonal, so they are doing pretty similar most of the time. But there are these cases where Moore's Law in particular makes fairly bad errors, because this would be zero here. This would be a perfect forecast. So for these points here, Moore's is making a lousy forecast, whereas Wright is making quite a good forecast. So see the difference in this data set we've studied so far seems to be that Wright's a bit more reliable. 
And one way to think about, well, so here we show some plots. As a function of the forecasting horizon, it's up to 25 years, and we look at some normalized error, and I'll explain more about that in a minute. And we compare the errors, which are on the, the normalized error using Moore's law here, here, sorry, Moore's law is this one, to the normalized error, normalizing the same way using Wright's law there. And what we see is over longer horizons, Wright's law is better. Now, I have to say that there's a caveat, it's important to understand, which is that what we're doing here is we were really saying, if we knew the cumulative production in that year, how good would the forecast be? So really this is about, if I asked you to forecast, would you rather know the date and forecast 10 years ahead? Or would you rather know the cumulative production to that point? And so we're really testing one that one information set that uses cumulative production against another one that uses just time. And so you can argue that, that it's not quite an apples to apples comparison, but I'll come back in a moment and say why that's important. Now, I put in a fairly recent slide here. Um, uh, this is a, maybe a bit technical, but I think it's kind of cool, so I couldn't resist putting it up here. We realized recently that actually for Moore's Law, we can make a very precise hypothesis about how the errors should increase in time. And in particular, if you just assume, take a standard statistical model, take a random walk with drift, geometric random walk with drift, that you can actually prove just by doing some kind of statistics calculations that if you look at the expected error, so this is the mean square error here, so we square it, we divide it by the estimated value of this noise coefficient, and then you can show that this error should increase as this expression here, where tau is the horizon, and m is the number of data points that you're using to fit your model on. So in the example I showed you, we were using six points to fit m. And, um, and so you can see there's a very precise formula that says, actually, asymptotically, the, error, the mean squared error is going to grow as a square of the time horizon. Um, now, so this green line here is that formula. And these points here are for Wright's Law and Moore's Law, the increase in error and a comparison to the actual errors as predicted by the formula. And this plot over here, when it, you can also show that actually if you take this factor over here and put it on the other side, so you end up with an expression like this, this is now, should be a student distribution with m minus 1 degrees of freedom. So a very precise prediction for what the errors are and what the distribution of errors is. And so that prediction is again this green line. And we show for three different horizons, um, we show what, what the predictions are. And you see that actually it's pretty damn good. We were, we were surprised it worked this well. So let me sort of underline what this is saying. It's saying that technological evolution is not just predictable. It's predictable with a known distribution of the errors that tell you about the quality of the prediction. Now, I'm not saying the predictions are astoundingly good. Um, so that the proof is in the pudding. And so, for example, one of the things we're trying to work out is our, what we can at least get good answers to are questions like, what is the probability that in 2030 that nuclear power will be cheaper than solar photovoltaic energy, assuming some, you know, the ability of both plants in the desert or something? So we can actually answer those kind of questions. I want to note, too, that the data that we have, and we collected 50 different data sets, there are lots of structure breaks in there. Some of these data sets, you know, you'll see the, the slope going along at one thing, and the slope will change at a certain point. The, the random walk of drift is not a perfect model, and yet it provides a pretty good estimate for the forecasting errors. Um, now let me say a little bit about why all this matters. Um, it's already said that Forecasting based on production seems to be better than just knowing the time. Um, now, one of the things this suggests is that maybe you can actually drive costs down. Because if you have a relationship that says as production increases, costs come down, then you can try and predict where costs will be if you boost production. And indeed, Theodore Wright, who by the way is the brother, if there's any biologists in the crowd, of Sewell Wright, who's one of the most famous evolutionary biologists, and 
I think it's Percy Wright, but I could be wrong, uh, who was considered one of the founders of political science. He was actually the black sheep of the family who went off to World War I and became a flying ace. That's the picture I showed you where he's in his flight jacket. And then went into the aviation industry after the war, wrote that one little paper. That's the only academic paper I know of. But during World War II, he was actually head of aircraft production for the US. And so he actually was using his own law to predict what the cost of airplanes was going to be as we scaled the effort up. And so there's at least anecdotal evidence to suggest that if you increase production, costs will come down. Now, the skeptic can argue that, well, um, how do we know it's not the other way around? Maybe what happens is costs come down, things get cheaper, so that means demand goes up because people can buy them more easily, so the causation is really going the other way. Well, so we're doing some artificial experiments and we're collecting data um, for World War II, and so here's an example of cumulative production versus cost. The, in this case, the, the drop in cost is not dramatic, but this is actually only over a fairly short span of time. We're collecting quite a lot of data from World War II, because in World War II, we had a nice natural experiment. We know that you know, the US, US before the war had the 18th largest military in the world. 18, I mean, that's kind of amazing to, believe, to, to, to think about now, that we were at only the 18th largest military. And, uh, and we didn't, and, and by the end of the war, the US had produced two thirds of all the military equipment on both sides. And that wasn't because it got cheap, and so there was a lot of demand, right? Roosevelt said, we're gonna produce this stuff, goddammit. In fact, there's a famous story, maybe somewhat apocryphal, but Roosevelt calling in the automobile manufacturers and telling them what they were going to do. And uh, they said that, Mr. President, if we do all that, we make all these Jeeps and carriers and so on, we aren't going to be able to produce any commercial cars. And he said, well, gentlemen, you've misunderstood me. You're not going to produce any commercial cars. <laughs> so anyway, we, we know what the cause and effect was. So we think we can resolve this, which is actually a very important question if you're asking, if you're trying to understand if we want to boost green energy, what's the right strategy to boost it? Um, now, I don't want to talk too long because uh, uh, it's late and so forth. Let me just say a little bit about causes. It happens, so, so first of all, let me go back to the other slide. Wright's Law, as I already mentioned, holds at a lot of different levels, and um, I think the explanation must be correspondingly general. There is no good explanation that I know of. We probably have the best one, and you can kick the tires yourself and ask how much it, whether it's convincing or not. I don't think it's fully convincing, but best out there, yeah. Um, so let me just first comment as another indication that this may be a fairly general thing. Maybe lots of things like this come down as power laws that are relating to tasks. There's also, in psychology, there's something called the power law of practice through a fellow named Blackburn who published a paper about it, also in 1936, in which he took subjects and had them do old-fashioned longhand arithmetic, so doing sums, and would have them do the sums and time how long it took them to do the sums, and these poor guys, so here's two subjects, subject S1 and S2, and you see, you know, you start here with the first one they did and how long that took them, and you keep going along, and so you see the data points, how long it took them to get what the average time it was taking them. And what you see is in both cases, it's a thing pretty much as a power law. Now notice this guy did, these guys did 10,000 sums. So um, that's quite a lot of room to take. Um, but they got better and better. Although it doesn't look like it here because we're plotting things on a power law, they are getting better slower and slower. If I plotted this in a standard way without plotting log log, and you looked at these pictures, then it would look like this, okay? So they are, they are improving more slowly as they go along, but, but nonetheless, they do continue to improve. Now, we developed something called a recipe model. The original version was from Muth, who, of this model, who postulated, well, let's suppose engineers make improvements by just throwing darts at a dartboard. So they draw the, the, their dart throws, where the darts land is drawn from some distribution, say uniform, and they throw the darts at the dartboard, and the engineers are just smart enough when they throw a dart to know whether it's better than any previous dart throws. And that's all they do. And so what he showed is that under that model, you get a power law improvement as, and if you plot it on um, 
or block, we get power law improvement. And furthermore, you get Wright's law, therefore, with an exponent of minus 1. So it's a more negative exponent than is commonly observed. You can actually show, by the way, that minus 1 is the limiting case, because Wright's law with minus 1 is what you get. Let's say you can build a factory, and once your factory is built, you can build as many units as you want for free. Then you get Wright's law exactly with an exponent of minus 1. You can show that pretty trivially. Um, there was another paper in 2000 by Oswald, Cotton, Lobo, and Shell, where they extended the model to say, suppose you have a device where different components depend on each other, and in order to make an improvement, the engineers in one department, if, they're, if their part of the device is interacting with the engineers with another part, then they have to um, coordinate their throws. So in particular, this is they, in, in, in large-scale engineering efforts, they use something called a design structure matrix. Here's an example for a laptop computer. So you can take the drive system and you can, of course, break this down into more subcomponents. And then for each subcomponent, you can make an X that has an interaction with the corresponding device laying around along the same way. And so we just postulate some design structure matrix. And we assume the engineers are throwing these darts. And, and well, I should say we. I mean, they did originally. And actually didn't know about design structure matrices yet. But that's OK. Same, same model. And um, so the difference is that now if um, Andrew's department and my department, we both throw our darts, we only get to accept the improvement if the sum of the two dart throws is better than what was before. So he can be really frustrated because he makes a really great dart throw, but it gets tossed out because I made a bad one on that turn. And that, of course, slows things down because now if you have five departments coordinating, you have to get the sum of all five to be better. And so the probability of getting good throws goes down and things slow down. Now, we solved this model. And um, so we simplified it and actually just solved it. The earlier guys did some simulations. And we were able to prove that it generates a power law uh, like Wright's law with exponent minus 1 over d, where this exponent d we call the design complexity depends on the, on the topological properties of the design structure matrix. And so if you have a homogeneous network, one way to think about that d is just the n degree of the design structure matrix. That is, if we set it up in our product so that each component interacted with exactly three components, three other components, then d would be 